Hello and welcome, everyone, to episode 51. In the previous episode, I explored plant hydration, how plants move water and sugar through their bodies to sustain photosynthesis and to sustain their growth. Today, I'm still going to be talking about tissue growth, except from a different angle. Instead of hydration, I'm going to explore plant nutrition. Plants don't just need water and sugar and sunlight, they also need particular elemental nutrients to create all of the molecules they need for their bodies. Proteins and DNA all require nitrogen and phosphorus, and numerous other enzymes and biomolecules require potassium, magnesium, sulfur, chlorine, and all sorts of other elements. These are the nutrients that plants need to produce nucleic acids for their DNA and amino acids for their proteins. It's what they need to produce functional chlorophyll molecules, as well as all kinds of enzymes. So in this episode, I'll be exploring the mechanisms through which plants extract nutrients from the soil. Where last episode focused on the roots and the shoots and the vascular tissue, stuff including the entire plant's body, today's episode will focus almost entirely on the roots, and how the roots selectively absorb the nutrients that the plants need. This will involve talking about both the roots on a cellular level and the type of soil that the plant is growing in. The type of soil is really important because every quality of the soil influences nutrient extraction from the organic content in the soil to the size of the mineral particles. When the roots absorb these nutrients, they get dissolved in the water that's flowing up the xylem and the upward flow of water deposits the nutrients throughout the plant's tissues, like a vertical river depositing silt along the shores and the riverbed. Except, instead of just being deposited here to create a muddy layer of silt on the riverbed, because a plant is a living organism, its cells are continuously uptaking all of these nutrients, and incorporating those nutrients into biomolecules, and using them to sustain their bodies and fuel their growth. Now, the most absorptive part of the root is in a short region directly below the root meristem. Recall from episode 49 that the meristem is a group of stem cells that exist on the very tip of the root, and these stem cells are perpetually dividing into daughter cells, and their perpetual division produces the cells that expand the root, that let the root grow. As the root meristem moves deeper into the earth, the root cells that it produces go through their basic phases of division, elongation, and maturation. These phases occur in the youngest cells immediately following the meristem, and the most absorptive part of the root is in this zone of maturation. These newly formed cells are fresh, they're just matured, and they're ready to go. And they're the first cells behind the meristem to have a layer of epidermis with root hairs. These root hairs increase the surface area tremendously, and thus the absorptive capacity of the root tissue. So the meristem penetrates into a region of soil, and then because of the immense surface area allowed by the root hairs, the cells in this zone of maturation will quickly absorb as much of the nutrients in, the, in this proximal region of the soil as they can. The perpetual root meristem growth allows the tip of the root to keep moving through the soil, and this absorptive region of the root that follows the meristem will also be perpetually carried to these new, unexplored, nutrient-rich regions of soil. I want to dive into the subject of nutrients by first describing a few soil types that roots typically grow in, so that you get a picture of the environment and the ecological context that the roots have evolved in. Soil is what composes the surface layers of the Earth's crust, above the mineral bedrock and below the air. The soil is composed of tiny particles and flakes of rock, as well as organic material like bits of roots or chunks of wood or other plant detritus and various flavors of dust from the skin, hair, fur, bones, shells, carapace, or whatever else of some dead, dissolved animal. These rock particles are often made through geological processes, by wind and water eroding stone over long periods of time to produce dust, or what, uh, what people call fines, or fine mineral particulates. Over shorter lengths of time, water can get into cracks in the rock and freeze, and as the water freezes and expands as ice, it can push the cracks in the rock farther apart, 
so these cycles of freezing can actually help break rocks apart. The soil can be anything from gravels and large rocks, to pebbles and sand, to silt and clays. The texture of the soil is also important. Soil that's composed of large, loosely fitting rocks, like a typical gravel bed, tends to be well aerated, but it's also poorly hydrated. Larger plants will have no trouble snaking their roots into the ground between these large gravel particles, but this kind of coarse soil doesn't really hold water very well. Water will just run through the spaces between the rocks. Clay soils are the opposite. Clay soils are composed of a lot of really tiny particles, and they absorb and hold onto water really well. Although, when these tiny clay particles get wet, this often makes the clay seal up like a thick mud, and as a result, the clay tends to have really low oxygen capacity and relatively low water movement. Water can't easily flow out of the clay soil, it's just kind of held there. And if you've ever walked on clay soil after it rains, for example, you'll see that the rain doesn't easily get absorbed into the clay, and you'll have a lot of standing water or a lot of really muddy topsoil. These kind of soils will discourage root growth because they're both dangerously anoxic and mechanically difficult to penetrate. Of course, soils can, and usually are, some mixture of gravel, sand, silt, and clay. There's a soil type called loam that's an ideal mixture of these elements. Loam is well aerated and easily hydrated, but it also works decently to hold onto the water without drowning or blocking out the plant's roots. The molecular qualities of the ions in the soil greatly influence its capacity to yield nutrients to the living root tissue. The soil's acidity, or its pH, is also really important. This measures the quantity of hydrogen ions in the soil, which reacts with plant root tissue in various ways. Soil with a high pH is basic, or alkaline, and it has very low concentrations of hydrogen ions. These alkaline soils typically exist near limestone deposits, because the calcium carbonate in limestone will react with water and the hydrogen ions to create bicarbonate ions. These bicarbonate ions are formed when the CO3 of the calcium carbonate bonds with a hydrogen ion, and so, basically, the hydrogen ions get absorbed and consumed into the carbonate minerals and pulled out of the soil. This raises the pH of the soil, and you end up with very alkaline soil conditions. Now, acidic soils are the opposite. Acidic soils have a low pH and a very high concentration of hydrogen atoms. The acidity is typically generated through biochemical processes, where acidic biomolecules are formed through the decay processes of local plants. Evergreen conifers, for example, shed their needles throughout the year, and these shed needles that are now on the ground at the foot of the tree will rot away and dissolve, and as they do so, they release nitric acid and phosphoric acid and various other kinds of organic acids. Most plants will typically do well in soils that have a, a neutral pH, around 6 to 8, although some species in various parts of the world are adapted to thrive in the more acidic or more alkaline soils that they live in, like the evergreen conifers, which prefer slightly more acidic soils. And so, in the sense that them shedding their needles is what makes the soil acidic, the evergreen conifers are adjusting their environment to make it more comfortable for them. They're, they're altering their habitat to make it more habitable. And this is just one example. There's a lot of plants that do this, or that do something like this. The nutrients in the soil come in the form of ions, or lone atoms of elements heavier than hydrogen polarized with an electric charge. The ions that have a negative charge are called anions. These anions are readily dissolved in water and as a result, they can be easily absorbed by the root tissue as it absorbs the water. These dissolved anions in the water will enter the plant's xylem and get swept up in the perpetual current that's moving from the roots to the shoots. Now, this might sound pretty convenient because they're easily absorbed and easily moved through the body, but there is a downside to this. Because the anions are easily dissolved in water, they can be washed out of the soil just as easily as they can be absorbed by a plant's roots. This leaching effect, caused by rain or heavy watering in an agricultural area, 
can strip the topsoil of nutrients, making it much harder for plants to grow there. Positively charged ions, on the other hand, are called cations. These cations are also readily dissolved in water, but they're less bioavailable than anion nutrients because the cations are also attracted to negatively charged compounds in the soil. Organic material, for example, tends to be negatively charged, particularly because of all the water and the oxygen and the DNA. All of the genetic material is also negatively charged, in addition to a lot of other biomolecules. But anyway, organic material tends to be negatively charged, and so this negatively charged material will attract and bind to and hold on to the cations, or these positively charged ions. Clay soils, in particular, are very negatively charged and so clay soils will tightly cling to their cations. Clay soils also hold onto water really well, and through hydrogen bonding, the water will hold onto anions, and through polar attractions, these anions will hold onto cations, typically in the form of salts, like Na plus Cl minus ions, which makes sodium chloride, also known as table salt. This hydrogen bonding and the polar attraction makes the cations really hard to pull away from the soils, so the roots struggle to absorb them. There are soils that are rich in organics and clays, and thus rich in nutrients, but they're terrible for growing plants because the plants can't extract and hold on to any of these nutrients. It's like if you were hungry and surrounded by food, but all of the food it's all encased in a bunch of unbreakable glass orbs, so all you can do is look at it and salivate. This same problem also exists for plants that are trying to grow in clay-rich soil. In acidic soils that have a high concentration of hydrogen ions, all of these hydrogen ions can interact with the cations to peel them off of the organic matter and the clays in the soil. This is because the hydrogen ions are positively charged, as are the cations. And so, the hydrogen ions, typically being smaller than the cations, which are usually like uh, sodium or something like that, some larger element, some larger atom, the hydrogen atoms are able to sneak in and bump off the larger ions and take their place against the negatively charged surfaces of the organic matter or the clay in the soil. This process is called cation exchange, because the protons are basically exchanging themselves for cations as the free ions in the soil. In particularly acidic clays, this cation exchange can be enough to overcome the negative attraction and make cations readily bioavailable for plants. So I know that I was just saying that acidic soils and clays can be dangerous for plants because the environmental conditions aren't really that conducive to root health, but if you combine them so you have a very acidic clay soil, well, some of the negative qualities of each will cancel themselves out, and you actually get some soil that's a little more conducive to plant growth. That's kind of counterintuitive, but pretty cool nonetheless. Anyway, all of these ion nutrients are scattered throughout the soil in a relatively low concentration. But inside of the plant's tissues, inside of the cells, the nutrients are tightly concentrated into the form of enzymes, and DNA, and all sorts of other biomolecules. What this means is that to get the nutrients out of the soil, the nutrients have to be pulled against their concentration gradient. Consider that this is the opposite of water which follows a gradient of decreasing water potential as it moves from the wet soil into the slightly less wet roots, up the stem and out the leaves into the dry air. So, with regard to mineral nutrients, how do plants do it? How do they go against the ion concentration gradient to absorb nutrients out of the soil? In a nutshell, it's proton pumps. Understand that the epidermal cells have plasma membranes partially exposed to the air. The root hairs are just projections of exposed cell membrane. They aren't protected behind a cell wall. This phospholipid membrane of the extended root hair is studded with enzymes that allow the cell to do all sorts of stuff on a chemical level. The key to a lot of this activity is proton pumps. Plant root cells have enzymatic structures called H plus ATPases, or ATPases, which consume a molecule of ATP 
to push out one proton, or one hydrogen ion, out of the cell and into the nearby soil. This energy-expensive process creates a pool of protons directly outside the root cell's membrane. What effects are caused by a high proton concentration? So let's think about this for a second. What happens when you have a high concentration of protons right outside the cell membrane? If you said that it lowers the pH, so you, you create this highly acidic condition, you're correct. Additionally, the positive charge on all of the protons creates a positive charge on the outside of the cell membrane. This creates a voltage difference between the outside and the inside of the cell, kind of like a concentration gradient, except instead of differences in concentration of some particular solute, it's differences in electrochemical potential. And just like solutes flowing from a high concentration to a low concentration, charged particles will also flow down their electrochemical gradient. So these proton pumps push a lot of protons out of the cell. And in addition to creating a proton concentration gradient where the protons want to flow back into the cell, this makes the conditions outside of the membrane very acidic and very positively charged, while conditions inside the membrane are negatively charged and much less acidic. The positive charge that's accumulating outside of the root tissue will repulse the positively charged ions in the soil, the, the cations like calcium and potassium. And because the inside of the cell is negatively charged, this electrochemical gradient will attract the cations that have been dislodged out of the soil, and it will pull them into the cell. Now, the cations are too big to move through the sheet of phospholipids in the membrane itself. So instead, they move through protein tubes, called channels. These protein channels penetrate the cell's membrane and create a travel corridor for the cation. Because of the electrochemical gradient, it's all just a matter of the cation finding itself close enough to a channel to get absorbed into the cell. Alright, so that's cations, but we also have anions, or negatively charged ions, and these are repulsed by the negatively charged environment inside the cell. So, to move the anions against their electrochemical gradient, the root has to tap into the proton electrochemical gradient. To do this, root cells use enzymes called co-transporters that can move two particles simultaneously. The particular direction that each particle moves depends on what kind of co-transporter the enzyme is, and what its purpose is. For example, a co-transporter enzyme that moves both particles in the same direction, like say both particles are outside of the cell, and the co-transporter enzyme is moving them both inside of the cell, so they're going in the same direction, the, the co-transporter enzyme here is called a symporter, while an antiporter moves the particles in opposite directions. So an antiporter might take one particle from outside and bring it in, while simultaneously moving a particle from the inside to the outside. Various organisms will use different co-transporters depending on their chemical needs. In plants, a symporter is used to transport a proton and an anion from the soil outside the cell to be deposited on the inside of the cell. To do this, the symporter has to move the proton along with its concentration gradient, which is pretty easy because the proton naturally wants to flow down its concentration gradient but it also has to move the anion against its electrochemical gradient, and that isn't easy. Because of the proton pumps and their perpetual regurgitation of protons back out into the nearby soil, the proton electrochemical gradient is really big. It's large enough that the energy harvested from letting a proton in is more than enough energy to push an anion against its electrochemical gradient. So, it's through these proton pumps that the root cells are able to create the external conditions necessary to attract and simultaneously absorb both positively and negatively charged ion nutrients. But there are other cations and anions in the soil, ions that are less conducive to the good health and nutrition of the plant. Metal ions like cadmium, lead, and zinc can be harmful to plants by disrupting their enzymes and gracelessly interrupting the biochemical orchestra that goes on inside their cells. Even nutrients that the plant legitimately needs, like calcium or phosphorus, can be dangerous if the plant is exposed to too much of it, 
First and foremost, the root cells have a passive defense system that protects them from particular ions. This passive defense system is basically the total lack of specific enzymes. If the cell lacks the genes to make a protein channel or a co-transporter that allows cadmium to pass through, for example, then the cell simply won't express any cadmium transport enzymes, and cadmium will not be able to enter the cell in the first place. Some ions might think that they can sneak around this, by flowing in the water going in the epiplastic pathway between the cell walls. But these ions are stopped from entering the plant's vascular tissue by the Casparian strip. This structure, this Casparian strip, is a waterproof sheet of endodermis that creates a tight seal between the vascular tissue and the ground tissue, and its job is just this, to prevent unwanted wayward ions from sneaking in through the flow of water. But in the cases where the plant cells do express a transport protein that allows that particular ion in, these ions can still poison the plant if they become too concentrated. And this can be a serious problem for plants that live next to mining operations, as they are inevitably exposed to the minerals and the runoff of the mined-out earth. Zinc mines, for example, saturate the nearby soil with zinc particles, and the plants have to deal with this. Usually, plants will take in the tiny amount of zinc that they need to stay healthy. But when they're exposed to high concentrations of zinc, the zinc can build up in their tissues to dangerous levels. To prevent this kind of metal toxicity, the plant expresses genes that code for little proteins called metallothionines. These itty-bitty metallothionines coat the metal ions and basically nerf them, making them completely unreactive and thus non-toxic. Remember from the last episode how I talked about how roots can store sugars in their vacuoles? The vacuole is basically a huge, empty storage pocket inside of a plant cell, and it's surrounded by a selective membrane called a tonoplast. Various plants of all kinds have proteins in their tonoplasts that will suck up metal ions from the cytoplasm and store them safely inside the vacuole. This is a pretty interesting defense, as the plant cells aren't actually removing the toxic amounts of metals from the plant's body. They're just isolating the metal ions in a safe place within their cells, kind of like an armored dumpster. When you look at the tissues of plants that are able to survive in metal-rich soils, you might see discolorations, where so much metal has been accumulated in all of the vacuoles of the plant cells that it actually creates a visible shift in the color of the plant. Alright, so at this point, I've talked a lot about nutrients and ions and how the plant absorbs them, but I haven't really talked a whole lot about what these nutrients actually are and what the plant uses them for. In the first two episodes of the series, I talked about how plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, and in the last episode I talked about how plants absorb water into their body and move it up to their leaves where it undergoes transpiration and returns to the air. But in addition to CO2 and water, plants also need calcium, which exists as the ion Ca2+. The 2 plus is a reference to the calcium ion's charge. It has two more protons than electrons, so it's not neutrally charged, it's slightly more positive. And because there's two more protons than electrons, it has a 2 plus charge, hence Ca2+. Alright, moving on. The plant uses calcium for all manner of purposes. Calcium ions get integrated into the plant's cell wall. It's used as a part of enzymes. It stabilizes the plasma membrane, and much more. If the plant lacks calcium, it will suffer catastrophically for it. Its roots and leaves will be malformed and grow into weird shapes, and the whole plant will be riddled with necrotic patches of dead tissue. Another common nutrient is potassium or k ions. These are just k not 2 because the potassium ions just have one more proton than electrons. So these potassium ions are used much like calcium. They're used in all manner of regulatory functions and enzymatic processes. Potassium is really important for regulating water concentration and water transport through the plant cells. Without enough potassium, the plant's growth is diminutive, and its tissue is weak. 
In addition to these critically important nutrients of calcium and potassium, plants also need sulfur, phosphorus, and magnesium. And these are all macronutrients, which are nutrients that the plant needs in relative abundance. It needs a lot of these nutrients. Now alongside these macronutrients are the micronutrients, which are nutrients that the plant needs in relatively small quantities, or micro quantities. Some of these micronutrients include zinc, as well as boron, copper, iron, and chlorine. Zinc is used for enzyme regulation and synthesis of a growth hormone called auxin. Boron is used to stabilize both cell membranes and cell walls. Copper is used in enzymatic reactions, and it's also used in lignin, which is the main structural molecule in heavier plant tissues like wood. Iron is necessary for many functions, including the synthesis of chlorophyll, which the plant needs to conduct photosynthesis. Chlorine is required for its interactions with water, including a critical step in photosynthesis, which requires breaking down water molecules. A chlorine atom is required for this particular step. Deficiencies in any of these micronutrients leads to subtle but increasingly obvious problems in the plant, like necrotic spots and chlorosis. One of the most important macronutrients that a plant needs is nitrogen. Nitrogen is used in almost everything, from proteins and DNA to chlorophyll and the energy molecule ATP. Without enough nitrogen, plants will be weak small and yellowed. They will be malnourished in every sense of the word, as they don't have a key chemical ingredient for virtually every protein and cellular function that they need to survive. This high demand for nitrogen has been a hugely motivating evolutionary force in both plants and fungus, promoting diverse mechanisms for nitrogen acquisition, like chemical fixation, cellular symbiosis, or even a carnivorous diet. Yes, even plants can be carnivorous. Now, technically speaking, nitrogen is really common. In the soil, nitrogen exists in nitrate ions, or in nitrogenous compounds like ammonium. But plants need far more nitrogen than they can ever hope to get out of the soil. Nitrogen is also in the air, where it makes up almost 80% of the planet's atmosphere in the form of molecular nitrogen, N2. But the problem with N2 is that it's composed of two nitrogen atoms that are bound by a triple bond. That triple bond is really strong, and it's really hard to break. Because of the inherent difficulty in breaking a triple bond, only a select handful of species have ever evolved the means to do it. And even within these species, the process of breaking down molecular nitrogen, which is called nitrogen fixation, is extremely energy-intensive, and it requires a hugely complex suite of proteins. Every species that can fix nitrogen is microscopic. They're bacteria and archaea, or single-celled fungus. But this is good news, because it means that they can more easily live inside the cells of plants. This is exactly the case with the bacteria in the genus Rhizobium, many of which reside inside the cells of plants in the legume family. Because of these nitrogen-fixing bacteria that extract molecular nitrogen from the air and convert it into bioavailable nitrogen sources, these legumes are nitrogen-rich. Legume plants like peas, soybean, and clover have little nub-like growths, or bulges on their roots, called nodules. And these nodules are filled with symbiotic nitrogen-fixing bacteria. I should clarify that these nodules are not sacs of bacteria growing off of the root. It's a region of plant cells that are infected with bacteria. And just like the tuber is a portion of root tissue with sugars packed into the vacuoles of the cells, the nodules in these legumes are plant tissue with cells packed with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. These cells create an internal environment that's devoid of oxygen, which would destabilize the proteins required for nitrogen fixation. So inside of these oxygen-free, optimized plant cells, the rhizobia can safely fix nitrogen and feed what it produces back to the plant. It's really interesting how this symbiotic relationship happens. The legume plant releases chemicals out of its roots called flavonoids, 
which come into contact with the rhizobium bacteria in the soil and stimulate them to create chemicals called nod factors. These nod factors are chemicals that will come back into contact with the legume's root cells. The nod factor chemical will bind with certain proteins and activates a specific signaling mechanism within the legume cells. And this is where it gets really crazy, because this signaling mechanism primes the root cells to create an infection thread. When a rhizobium bacteria touches a primed root hair, it creates an inward projection of the plasma membrane. Where a root hair is an outward projection of the membrane coming off of the root itself, this inward projection within the root hair is like a tunnel that goes back into the root hair itself. This tunnel, this infection thread, extends down the root hair into the cortex, into the root tissue of the plant itself. The bacteria will thrive near the opening to this tunnel, and when the tunnel descends into the plant tissue itself, all of these bacteria that are crowding around the opening to the tunnel will flow down the tunnel into the plant cells. This tunnel is called an infection thread, because it is literally the thread by which the legume root cells are infected with rhizobium bacteria. Once infected, these cortex cells divide and create the outward growth called the nodule. All of these cells in this nodule are infected with rhizobia, although the word infected carries a negative connotation. Instead of being a negative thing where the infection is harmful and hurts the plant, this infection creates a symbiotic relationship that's been shaped by evolution, where the bacteria produce and share nitrogenous compounds, and the plant produces and shares sugar. Make no mistake, though, this symbiotic relationship is not perfectly equal. You could almost say that the plant is getting taken advantage of. The plant needs nitrogen, it really needs it bad, and the rhizobia can provide that nitrogen, but at a really high cost. The rhizobium bacteria require a huge amount of sugar to fulfill basically all of its needs. To grow and divide, it needs chemical energy, and sugar provides that chemical energy. It also needs carbon compounds to physically grow itself, and sugar provides that carbon. And then you have the process of nitrogen fixation, which is, in and of itself, very energy expensive. The plant has to provide all of the sugar that the rhizobium bacteria needs, not just to fix nitrogen, but to keep themselves alive and to reproduce. In return for this huge sugar investment, the bacteria will produce a little bit of nitrogen, which the plant rapidly gobbles up and incorporates into its proteins, its cells, and its DNA. Now, with all of this being understood, it really shouldn't be too surprising that some plants will look at this symbiotic relationship and say something like, forget this, I'm not being taken advantage of by some bacteria, and that's all well and good, but these plants still need nitrogen. So if they aren't evolving a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen-fixing bacteria and their rapacious appetite for sugar, then how do these plants get the nitrogen they need? Well, they turn to other sources of bioavailable nitrogen in their environment. Some plants are parasitic, and they'll grow on other plants and penetrate their tissues to tap into their xylem, where they can steal water and nutrients, including nitrogen. Some plants are less invasive, and these are called epiphytes. And while the epiphytes grow on the outside of other plants, they actually don't parasitize their hosts. Instead, the epiphytes express morphologies that allow them to capture and retain airborne stuff. Epiphytes often have leaves that overlap in such a way as to create little recessions, or half-bowl shapes, and these can hold rainwater like a cup. They can also accumulate dust and pollen and other airborne particles that can be broken down and absorbed for their nutrients. As you're probably thinking, this is a pretty meager diet. You know, you really can't rely too heavily on nutrients in the form of dust in the air. I mean, how can you get a lot of food when that's your diet? And so as a result, a lot of these epiphytes tend to be very small, and they grow very slowly. There are some plants that have turned to flesh to get their nitrogen, like the flesh of insects and even small vertebrates. But you might be thinking... Plants can't eat meat, they aren't carnivores, they don't have mouths, they don't have claws and fangs, they just have roots and leaves that absorb stuff on a molecular level right out of the soil or the air, right? Well, not exactly. 
Some plants do have mouths. Some plants are carnivorous. Several lineages have evolved mechanisms to capture insects and dissolve their bodies in a way that all of their nutrients can be absorbed, including the precious nitrogen. The capture mechanism is typically created out of leaf tissue that's evolved a specialized purpose. In pitcher plants, leaf tissue evolved to form an enclosed basin, or a cup, that has a very slippery lip. The insect will land on the rim of the cup or the pitcher, and they'll slip and fall inside, where they get soaked in a fluid solution at the bottom of the pitcher that will trap them and slowly dissolve them. In Venus flytraps, the leaf tissue has evolved into two sensitive plates, like jaws, and on the inside of each plate are a few little hairs. When an insect lands on the leaf plate and bumps up against one of these sensitive little hairs, they send a signal that causes the leaf plates to slam shut and trap the insect. As the insect struggles inside the plant's grasp, the root hairs are further stimulated, and this just encourages the, the leaf plates to close down harder and to secrete digestive enzymes. This captured insect will struggle, and by struggling, it will release the acids that will eventually kill it. What's kind of interesting is that these carnivorous plants are usually found in areas where nitrogen is rare in the soil. And this would make sense, as living in a habitat with poor nitrogen would encourage the plants, evolutionarily, to find new means of acquiring nitrogen. But studies have shown that if you grow these carnivorous plants in nitrogen-rich soils, where there's a lot of nitrogen available for them without having to eat animals, these plants will actually produce fewer of these insect-eating structures, like flytraps or pitchers. In this way, the production of these carnivorous plants' mouthparts seems to be regulated by genetic expression, and that genetic expression is itself regulated by the environmental availability of nitrogen in the soil. All right, well, that is all that I have for you today on plant nutrition. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something cool about a plant's diet and about how they extract nutrients from the soil, despite all of the concentration gradients and electrochemical gradients that can get in the way. And if you're enjoying this series on plant physiology, then stick around for the next episode, which will cover plant senses. I'll be discussing how plants maintain their internal homeostasis in the face of a changing external environment and how plants have a very primitive, floral awareness of their external conditions, like the direction of gravity, the location of the sun, and even the presence of herbivores eating their leaves. So if that sounds cool, then hit the subscribe button so you can see that episode right when it comes out. If you're listening to this on YouTube, then hit the like button and leave a comment. And if you're listening to this episode in iTunes, then do me a solid and give the podcast a good review in the iTunes store. Every little bit you do helps spread the word and gets the podcast out to more people so that we can share our enthusiasm of the biological world with the people around us. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh.